freedoms set out in the Bill of Rights as the demonstration as well as intent of its institutional dispensation. The Constitution severely restricts the range of conditions under which these rights and freedoms may be limited and forecloses any possibility of the state avoiding its obligation to observe, respect, protect, promote, and fulfill these rights and fundamental freedoms. All the functions performed by the state in the name of the people affect their experience of at least one right and or fundamental freedom. It is thus possible to categorize state functions in terms of the rights and freedoms directly affected by them. The organs of government, together with their, fundament, uh, with their constituent mandates and functions, as well as commissions and independent offices, are explicitly and implicitly directed towards the observance and fulfillment of certain constitutional obligations connected with corresponding rights and freedoms. The national values and principles of governance set out in Article 10 are both the means as well as the ends of the actualization of the constitutional dispensation and implementation of rights and freedoms. We have classified our ministries, departments, and agencies into thematic clusters for effective coordination of delivery and for better evaluation of performance. The thematic clusters are based on the pillars of our bottom-up economic transformation agenda, commonly known as the plan, for the rapid socio-economic transformation of our country to achieve shared prosperity from the bottom going up. A number of functions can be seen to be cross-cutting and may be understood to be principally enablers. In any event, the pillars of our transformational agenda converge with the economic and social rights in Article 43 of our Constitution. We are, on a continuous basis, mindful of the constitutional imperatives tied to our work. They inform our intentions as well as our methods. I realize with much humility that to perform these functions, discharge our commitments and actualize the foregoing obligations, I am vested with the constitutional authority to constitute certain offices and to appoint state and public officers. I am also authorized to mobilize resources and allocate them for expenditure through the budget in order to finance performance of their duties. I do not perform these functions in isolation. I must receive sound technical advice through my cabinet and other agencies, consult other organs of government, and defer to the feedback from commissions and independent offices. The people's representatives in parliament furnish me with the necessary instruments to act, including to allocate and spend funds. From time to time, the judiciary likewise furnishes me with decisions, opinions, and advisories arising from its exclusive constitutional mandate to interpret the Constitution and all laws. We are cognizant of this robust system of checks and balances, which locks us into a purposive dynamic that permits us to do only right and proper acts and restrain us from pursuing improper and illegitimate objectives and causes of action. The Constitution recognizes the need for an institution to safeguard government against perverse or undesirable effects arising from a distortion of the system of checks and balances through collusion, capture, impunity, or asymmetry. It also recognizes the possibility of abuse, corruption, conflict of interest, and undue influence that can undermine the effectiveness of government and frustrate public interest. 
the safeguard designed by the Constitution to ensure that the public interest is insulated from failures in the three arms of government is the institution of commissions and independent offices set out in Chapter 15 of the Constitution. The objects for which they are established are explicit. One, to protect the sovereignty of the people. Two, to ensure the observance by all state organs of democratic values and principles. And three, to promote constitutionalism. A very strong indicator of their safeguard or a very strong indicator of, the, of their safeguard role is the constitutional architecture in the fact that they are only subject to the constitution, the law, and utterly liberated from any external influence, control, or direction. Likewise, to further highlight this constitutional pride of place, the tenure, terms of service, discipline, and removal are rigorous and entailed by design and are also explicitly expressed in the Constitution itself. To remove a member of a commission or holder of independent office, a petition has to be transmitted to the President after consideration by the National Assembly. The President may suspend the member, but shall appoint a tribunal to investigate the matter and make a binding recommendation to the President. There is no provision for a tribunal to say the President will decide. It is the tribunal that decides whether that person is dismissed or is reinstated. Commissions and independent offices are indispensable to the integrity, efficiency, and effectiveness of government. Much in the same way as the internal audit function does to organizations. It generates actionable insights to orient strategy implementation so as to avoid risks and losses, enhance integrity and accountability, and improve governance and controls. We are committed as an administration to full and consistent compliance with the Constitution as a means of achieving sustainability in our governance agenda and demonstrating that sustainable development demands institutional soundness, which calls for constitutionalism. We are not going to indulge in the escapist fallacies of excusing impunity by citing development or the cynical binaries pitting prosperity as a trade-off against freedom, or for that matter, compromising democracy and oversight in the name of unity. We will never go back to the handshake conundrum that compromised the oversight role of the opposition of a government in the name of unity. And we are going to demonstrate that it is possible to work with the people who did not vote for you as an opposition, holding government to account, but serve all the people of Kenya without distinction of who voted for which side. That is a possibility. And that is a reality we must live with. The integrity of the state lies in constitutionalism. For us to deliver on our commitments and achieve the transformation we envisage, we must recognize that our institutions matter. All institutions matter. As you know, this position is not new. We pledged to take measures to enhance the autonomy and efficacy of independent institutions from the first day of this administration. I can confirm to you that shortly after our inauguration, I executed necessary instruments to appoint judges who had, been waited, who had waited inordinately, unnecessarily, for long. 
I also transferred the police budget, which was unnecessarily, unconstitutionally, and illegally in the office of the president. I transferred that budget to the office of the inspector general and appointed the IG to be the police service accounting officer. I will also enhance the budgetary allocation to the judiciary as promised with, a, with continuous commitment to sustain it for five years in order to accelerate its urgently needed infrastructure development, especially in terms of constructing new court uh, stations in presently unserved or understaffed parts of the country. I remember instructing uh, last week our uh, comptroller, who was the accounting officer for the defunct NMS, to transfer the money to the judiciary for them to pay for the small claim courts that have been established in Nairobi as part of my commitment when I took office. We therefore have a good track record in connection with this commitment because we believe in doing the right thing not because it is politically expedient or otherwise advantageous, but because it is the right thing. And the Constitution is our ultimate benchmark of what is right. We have walked this road for a while now, and the judiciary can bear witness that there has been no attempt whatsoever to capture the judiciary or any of its constituent organizations and departments, or any of its officers. We want to strengthen our republic by expanding its economy while enriching its institutions. And I mean all institutions. The institutions of parliament, the institution of the judiciary, the institutions under the chapter 15 institutions of uh, independent offices and independent commissions. Any policy which has the intention or effect of undermining or compromising the autonomy and effective functioning of commissions and independent offices directly assaults the people's sovereignty and through commission or omission sabotages the realization of important rights and freedoms. The existence of the institution of commissions and independent offices, therefore, must force us to stay vigilant at all times and mindful of every real boundary that exists between organizations and agencies of state and government and by implication of the clear, inevitable, and rigid limits constitutionally imposed on the power and authority we exercise in the public interest. The performance of the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission in the last general election and all the circumstances surrounding it are illustrative of this point. A while back, senior politicians teamed up to manage the presidential succession that was due in 2022 with a view to guaranteeing a very specific outcome of the ensuring election. A political mechanism was therefore instituted to facilitate this objective through the capture of autonomous constitutional bodies. In the case of the IEBC, this mechanism resolved to infiltrate the organization by introducing at its highest level four sleeper commissioners whose sole task was to lie in wait for the election, then spring into action and take drastic actions to subvert the will of the people. You have heard how the scheme was hatched in parliament. At the same time, the mechanism constituted a syndicate to execute a series of strategies consisting of bribery, blackmail, extortion, threats, and intimidation of various public officials of the IEBC, attempt their abduction,
torture and assassination, to storm the National Tallying Center and attempt treasonous insurrection, use of violence to cause the alteration of the vote tallying, as well as entice or bribe or force the IBC chair to announce their favored candidate, or failing this, eliminate him and replace him with a willing accomplice from among the sleepers. The horrifying drama at Bomas and the emergence of breakaway commissioners answering to external instructions represented a dismayingly low point in our democratic history. A policy to subvert the wishes of the people had even been sanctioned at the highest offices of the state. The sovereignty of the people was in jeopardy. Our fundamental constitutional attribute as a free, open, democratic society based on constitutionalism and the rule of law was under severe test. Chapter 7 of the Constitution on the representation of the people was subjected to the most shameful, egregious assault. As a result, the nation's legitimate mechanism for constituting parliament and the executive was under serious threat of chaos and paralysis. This is the magnitude of the atrocity which shamefully desperate criminal spectacle of the bombers of Kenya represents. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate events of 2007-2008 are fresh in our minds. By the time we hauled ourselves out of the abyss